Hello, everyone. With the coronavirus currently revealing extreme holes within our current systems of operations, our world has the opportunity to learn from this situation and take on innovative and ethical practices for the betterment of the planet and its people. That's why Orlando Zero Hour has taken this as an opportunity to launch an educational campaign, Project Reuse and Reduce, which strives to teach Orlandoans on four sustainable topics that they can target and work to contribute to. Today, I'm joined on a fast fashion panel with Natalia J. Mack, Laura Jones, Joelle Fransley, and Stacey Oliver to talk about fast fashion. And I want to first define what fast fashion is for the purpose of this panel. Fast fashion is described to be inexpensive designs that move quickly from the catwalk to stores to meet new trends. Impacts of fast fashion include air and water pollution and labor exploitation. For this first question, I will give panelists two to three minutes to answer what immediate reforms need to be made within the fashion industry. Well, I can start. So as far as reforms for the fast fashion industry, I would say first priority would be to pay their workers a fair wage. Um, in doing that, I think it would cause these businesses to have to change other aspects of their business model, which would um, in turn lead to a more sustainable business. So for instance, if they started out paying their uh, workers a fair wage, they likely wouldn't have the budget to create so much uh, overproduction of garments. So they wouldn't have a lot of excess inventory that is often wasted. Um, they also might have to cut down on transportation costs and things like that that are a little bit excessive um, to promote convenience. So they might have to build some new systems in place so that they can afford to keep going. So I, I would start with paying workers a fair wage, you know, because it's the right thing to do and also because it would help hopefully um, lead to change after that. So I would totally agree with what Stacy had just said. And to add on that, there is a, a big initiative that happened during COVID because after COVID and the closure of businesses and factories and even countries, um, more than 1,000 uh, garment factories were closed in uh, Bangladesh and they reported cancel orders that are worth three point. $17 billion in export sales from big company, which affected approximately two, uh, 2.4 million workers, garment workers. So after that, and um, they uh, remade, which is an NGO focused on labor work, uh, put out an initiative called Pay Up that is pushing those, uh, those big companies uh, to uh, and urging the international brand and retailers to pay and honor their commitment to those to those uh, to those garment workers or in garment factory because production was already made. So I totally agree that it's an ongoing uh, you know issue that we have in in the fashion industry that took another another big toll after COVID. Um, and what I heard is. Uh, as an update, is that 13 brands, 13 big brands, and when I'm talking about big brands, it's Target, it's H&M, uh, it's uh, CNA, Primark, that actually accepted now to pay uh, uh, a value of $7.5 billion to the government workers in Bangladesh. Um, and I would add to that, in addition to the very crucial um, reform of looking after workers and paying workers fairly both locally and abroad. Um, fashion companies really need more robust and transparent systems of measuring their carbon output and their greenhouse gas emissions. Right now, 
it's very rare um, for a fashion brand to have a grasp of what their emissions are. And this is, to my knowledge, not regulated in any way. Um, and, you know, when we're looking at the fact that we really need to industry wide um, reduce carbon emissions by 50% by 2030 and to zero by 2050. Um, you know, the only way that we can even begin to do that is if we first know what the carbon output for companies is and then what the plan is to then swiftly and justly bring down that carbon output um, is for brands and then hold them to account to uh, achieving that that ambitious goal. Yeah, actually to go off from what Laura just said, um, one way that brands create a lot of um, carbon emissions is uh, when they're either, when they're getting rid of unsold stock. So like when you go to a fast fashion store like H&M and Forever 21 and Primark, like they don't sell all that stuff that they have on the floor. And a lot of times it, they, they send it to landfill, directly to landfill, or for the better brands, sometimes they do donate it to like Salvation Army, Goodwill, but that doesn't happen that often. What they usually do, and it, this is not just fast fashion, Burberry does it too, um, is they burn it and that creates huge amounts of pollution and that's not regulated. So I think that um, one legislation that should be applied worldwide, because I also feel like regulations should be global because it is a global fashion economy. So it should, um, there should be like some sort of regulation on waste production and waste management. And there should be taxes, there should be penalties, there should be, brands should be held accountable for the trash that they're producing. Thank you. And I really agree with the fact that we really need to hold a lot of these brands accountable. And I think that a first step that a lot of these brands can take is being transparent with the public about the practices that they're taking. And so how can we push these brands to be transparent with their consumers? Um. I think that, I mean, it's important to consider the fashion, the fashion industry, which is a $1.4 trillion industry is not considered one of those, you know, important industries still, um, you know, compared to oil and gas and all of that. So I think that's already one big thing that government should take into consideration. Now, yes, you know, uh, brands need to uh, also on their mind, they need to acknowledge that, you know, they, and brands and government that they have done something wrong that they cannot continue to use the same model that they have been using that is not sustainable today in our planet using all those resources so um i think like one way to look at it is really to look at you know to stop thinking that fashion like that fashion equals profit and think always about maximizing profit, maximizing profit without, you know, looking at all the impact and what have been, what they have been doing. So I do think that it's easy to say that we are transparent, you know, a brand can put out a report. We don't know exactly what's on that report. So, you know, yes, we can push brands to be transparent, but there is also a better way to do it. And I think the better way to do it is to kind of maybe put together a standardized regulation. You know, we have like uh, 500 certification out there. Each one of them is different. Each one of them has a different set of rules. And, you know, so we can, we can say, okay, we believe in that, but, you know, that doesn't work. And obviously each country, you know, have different set of rules. So I think one way to do it is really looking at a universal definition for transparency. So redefining it get a set of standardized reg, uh, regulation and kind of standardized index of how to, you know, how to rate transparency. Um, and in that, um, you know, looking at that, I would say that the, um, I would recommend everyone to look at uh, what Fashion Revolution is doing and their uh, yearly transparency index, uh, which is available on their website for free. 
Um, they review 250 brands this year, and they have an index that comprises 220 different indicators from you know, topics such as animal welfare, equality, um, labor rights, due diligence, etc. And I think you know, that's already a good way to put it. But we have to understand that because they're transparent, it doesn't mean that they're sustainable. I, I totally agree with that. I also think it's important to establish what a sustainable fashion brand is or an ethical, you know, fashion brand, because we have these terms and they don't really mean anything concrete. So uh, I think if we create a standard for what it takes to be a sustainable brand, and part of that would be including transparency. And I mean, it's it's one thing to put out a report of your carbon, emi- you know, carbon footprint, your greenhouse gas emissions, whatever, but a lot of people don't really know what those numbers should look like, right? So if we were to take, uh, let's say, one of the fashion conglomerates like Caring Company, right, which uh, they are the owners of like Volcom and Gucci and Stella McCartney, big powerhouse players in the fashion game. And if they were to set a standard of, you know, what a sustainable, you know, if you're going to call yourself sustainable or whatever, what that means in terms of numbers, um, that would set an example for other brands to live up to, right? And it, I feel like if we can help that kind of go viral, I guess, in a way, um, it might take off. You know, I, I had a professor once who used to talk about click moments, which is basically like short moments where exponential growth can be had. So like, for instance, we had the whole Harvey Weinstein, whatever, which spawned the Me Too movement, which has created this big click, mo- mo- click moment for women's rights. And then then, uh, we recently had the George Floyd murder, which has created a click moment for, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. So, I mean, we need to make sustainable fashion have a click moment, right? And if we got these powerhouse um, brands on board to create a standard, it would kind of retroactively uh, call out some of these brands who aren't living up to that standard. And I think exponential growth could then be made as they try to keep up with the Joneses, you know, in a way um, to try to make sure that they aren't seen in a negative light. So I I think that would be a great way to create um, kind of quick, rapid change. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I feel like you guys have really summed up pretty succinct and, and good answers to this question. Um, I think that, you know, the thing to um, be wary of is, yeah, the standardization, um, just just the um, finding a way to make sure that what doesn't happen is what currently happens. And that's a lot of language around sustainability that essentially is meaningless to your point. Like, I don't necessarily know that the definition of sustainability is without meaning. It's just that the way that it is currently used in marketing lingo lingo has rendered it meaningless, but it it does have a meaning. Um, We just don't hold brands to it enough. Um, And by we, I guess I would, start with saying fashion media, which is where I'm from. Um, you know, it's just because there actually has been like a really good um, groundswell of activism around a demand for sustainability, which in some pockets has been met with really good determined efforts to achieve sustainability. And then in a lot of cases has been responded to by brands with a lot of really great marketing using the word sustainability. Um, I don't have a great answer as to how to keep that from happening because it is like the special skill set of fashion is to create compelling, you know, um, marketing uh, assets that speak to what a customer wants. Um, I think it's really about there being a really good, strong connection between data and research, because there's also a, a huge glut of actual tangible information about how to make fashion more sustainable. There's a lot of really good ideas, but some of them have not, we don't actually know for sure if they are more sustainable if there are less sustainable. So we kind of need to create a better ecosystem where we're having great, you know, where we have 
systems of data and research and innovation. And we have some form of accountability whereby we can see whether or not this is being implemented. And then of course, um, transparent and clear and honest communication about that. And you know all the amazing customer activists out there who just keep insisting that we want better. Um, you know they really drive all the change. And so you know it's a lot of work to put on consumers, but but it does help. And so you know they're always the ones who who can keep on on pushing it forward. Um, yeah, I agree with everything everyone said. Um, I think that transparency is like the first step. Um, and I think it's like the bare minimum that like all brands can do. So I think a way that we can in like incentivize them to do it is like ask consumers asking questions. So like emailing your favorite brands and being like, hey, I want to know where you made this. I want to know what it's made of. I want to know if whoever made it was paid a fair wage. Um, and really, or like even asking these questions on social media, like putting brands on the spot. I think as consumers, that could really help push forward the sustainability and fashion agenda because, I mean, brands don't want to be looking like they're using slave labor. Um, and if they are, they're going to be like scared that they're going to be found out. So I think just asking questions, it's a good start. Um, Lorena, can I add one last thing before we move on? So there is also that, and, and Laura, you made that good point, is that it's nothing is easy. There is a challenge that... We are also an industry that is working with a lot, a lot of smaller third, fourth parties in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. So how do we know that those people are being paid? How do we know that? So all of that is, you know, makes it even harder. And I worked in Vietnam for three years. And believe me, I saw things that I would never have imagined seeing and, you know, I cannot, that's how actually I made my shift. And I think that, you know, that research point where brands, when it's so easy to say, yes, I did this and I did that, but some brands have so many suppliers, you know, that we don't, we, we can't be sure of, you know, of anything without like, keep on questioning, keep on. So it's not something that can happen in two seconds. I think the answer is, Yes, it's good to have that standard. It's good to have that rating. It's good to know who's doing better than the other. But ultimately, you know, to get to 100% transparency is going to take ages or we have to push back production, you know, to a more localized production, uh, which is, you know, also a question of, of profits and lowering profits. you guys brought up a lot of great points regarding you know like click moments so like how can we see like some sort of exponential growth within the industry and then even just discussing that this isn't a change that will happen overnight and a point that laura brought up that was really valuable was the fact that the fashion industry many times does take marketing standards that are incentivized towards the consumer. And so with that regard, I definitely want to introduce the audience to the term color washing. Sustainable fashion matters defines color washing as an umbrella term in which brands take a, they market themselves as taking ethical practices and standards into their production without actually falling through. So this is where terms such as greenwashing, where brands may coin themselves as sustainable or ethical while still causing irreversible damage to the environment or rainbow washing or even brown washing comes into play. And so my next question is really how do we combat color washing and recognize those standards that some brands are taking? I think that's a, I mean, it's, it's a really big question. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of asking how do you stop fashion brands doing the singular thing they're very good at, which is great marketing. Um, so having kind of worked in them as a stylist and many, many marketing campaigns, you know, that's, it's not, it's not an easy thing to do, but I think this is where, 
education is just becomes a really crucial component. I mean, I'm, I'm wary to sort of constantly, I'm, I'm wary to um, put everything always on the consumers, you know, again, like it's always just kind of like all these pieces have to come together, which is, you know, there needs to be better regulation or of some description. I don't know what that would look like of misleading campaigns um, and giving consumers misinformation, no matter what it is. Um, obviously, if it comes to kind of, for some things that's more difficult to apply than in others. But, um, you know, I think that, Pressure campaigns um, to have that regulation sort of put into place uh, is helpful in addition to education. Um, I think, you know, I think at a point if c consumers start to feel really overwhelmed, like, because it's kind of crazy for a consumer to be like, I have to know your carbon footprint. I have to know if you have true diversity. Like that's that's an insane amount of work to put on consumers. Um, for the mere fact that for some reason companies just have no accountability and can do whatever they want. And so um, I think that that means that pressure campaigns for accountability can be really effective in kind of addressing some of those larger issues without feeling completely and utterly overwhelmed and like you have to do endless research before you go ahead and, and buy something because you know, so I think it's like a both end. I think it's understanding as much as you can um, about the practices of a brand, but being cognizant that there are limits to what you can know and ultimately putting pressure on brands um, and regulatory bodies to help mitigate that on your behalf because that should be their responsibility um, is, is to me really important. I agree. I think education is the key. And I agree with everything that you said. And just to add on education is today, actually, um, sustainability, I don't even know how they call it. And so they are designers are required to take classes in sustainability and in, uh, you know, textile that is you know, they learn much more about the textile, they learn much more about sustainability. Uh, I think academia is pushing for fashion to be also, the history of fashion to be learned outside of West, the Western kind of like what we, we learn fashion. I studied fashion and it was mostly Western fashion. I had to look for, uh, for you know, my, like to, to read my own books, to learn more about, you know, I'm from the Middle East, fashion started in Egypt, so in Africa. The first dress came from, uh, from Egypt, not from, you know, not, it did not start with Marie Antoinette, who was the first fashionista, but still, you know, so I think that, um, that idea that education at home, at work, at university, like, you know, this is kind of like the base for everything. And today designers know much more than, you know, what we learned back when I was in, in, in university. So that's, I think that's a big key to how to, uh, it's a key to how to better understand. And I think that consumers are much more aware today that, um, you know, that brands can talk and talk and talk and then they, they, they don't see any long-term commitment. It's mostly short-term solutions, but we want to see more long-term long commitment. And, you know, we, we talk about a lot about like big brands like LVMH, like Kering and big groups talking about professional development. So taking classes in, you know, diversity, inclusion, uh, sustainability, environment, like climate change. And so I just hope that, it's not a trend anymore. Uh, fashion tends to also be uh, very much dependent on change. Fashion is all about change. It changes fast and quickly, and we're just asking it to slow down a little bit and to just to take the time and breathe and maybe just respect a bit more, you know, the environment and the people that work in that industry. Yeah. 
Yeah, I definitely agree. I think also one thing that might be beneficial is when it comes to things like, you know, greenwashing, color washing, things like that, um, we tend to gravitate toward like negative actions, like call out this brand for what they're doing, call out that brand, expose what they're doing and whatever. And we don't have a lot of um, positive actions that we do. So I would also suggest um, helping brands to set the good example and making that example the norm and like pushing for it to be the norm. And, and the way we can do that is when we see brands that are stepping up and showing their work, which I think is the biggest component, I guess, of setting the, the good example is showing what you're doing. When we see that, you know, we can spend our dollars there. And as we spend our dollars in these brands who are doing things, you know, in a, a kind of global positive way, uh, other brands will see that, you know, we, we can't force them to do things that are beneficial to planet and people because it's the right thing to do. Um, that should be enough, but it isn't. So, you know, we kind of have to put the fear in them that if they don't change their ways, they might not, they might not stay in business. So if we, you know, kind of spotlight and highlight and spend our dollars with these companies that are, are doing things responsibly, um, that will help create movement with those who are not doing things so responsibly, because if they don't, you know, realize that, hey, this is the best way forward, at the very least, they'll be realizing, oh, we're behind the times and we need to step up and move forward if we don't want to go out of business. I agree with Stacy 100%. I think the best way is hitting them where it hurts and that's with their money. So don't buy from brands that color wash. If you notice that a brand is like, for example, I noticed that there's brands that like after the Black Lives Matter movement blew up uh, like weeks ago, like they went from, it's like you see white woman, white woman, white woman, and then a black square and then you start seeing black women black women and then it's like but then if you scroll all the way down you don't see any other black women um and i there's also was an instance of this brand that like they were like they started posting uh, more black women more black models and influencers and then um they got called out and they're like well how come you didn't do it before and then they try to blame it on their on their followers saying like well, the, when we posted Black women before, the engagement went down. So we decided to stop. And so I just feel like if a brand is doing stuff like that and you don't like it and you feel like they're color washing, green washing, um, rainbow washing, you know, brown washing, just don't just unfollow them. Don't give them your money and then give the give your money to brands that are doing the things that you appreciate. Give your money to slow fashion brands, to brands that are ethical, to brands that are sustainable. Um, I think that's how we can move the movement forward more. Stacey and Natalia brought up some really good points, emphasizing how important it is to support brands that are practicing ethical manufacturing and production practices. And I feel like something that really needs to be talked about is what sustainability versus ethical means in regards to production practices. And so that's something I'd really like to highlight next because many times those two tend to be tied with one another. Yeah, so I think one of the more popular definitions of sustainable is an emphasis on uh, people, planet, and profit. And those three things kind of go in an equilateral triangle where none are more important than the other. So typically with sustainability, what we're trying to do is keep those things in balance so that we can continue to have this planet and, you know, if you have a business, you know, you can take you can continue to have those resources to, you know, have cotton to make your T-shirts and to have the um, whatever you use, you know, chemicals or natural plants to use uh, to make dyes, things like that. So it's kind of like, what do we need to do to continue 
this thing that we're doing, you know, to continue to do the thing that we're doing. And on the grandest scale, it's like to continue to have a planet to live on, right? But in terms of a business, it's, you know, so we can continue to have this business. When it comes to ethical fashion, um, it's very similar. It is still very much planet profit and people. But in my experience, does ethical fashion or, or ethical anything really has to do with um, kind of doing doing what's right, you know, and focusing on labor rights, focusing on uh, animal cruelty or animal testing, things like that. It has to do with um, like doing things that are inherently good for planet and people, which since it's a, a business, you know, you have obviously have to still have that profit piece in there. So those are kind of the distinctions that in my experience, um, I have learned between the two. They are, I mean, they very much go hand in hand. They're very much related, but sustainability is more about longevity and ethical has more to do with um, like the embetterment, I guess, of the planet. Yeah, and to um, to build on that point, that that's a, I think that's a really really good description, um, and like really sums it up. Um, I will share that there was a report that came out a couple of years ago that was really alarming to me. To your point, Stacey, of kind of longevity and being able to continue, you know, producing is that you know it. There are some studies that show that by twenty thirty, areas of the world will have to choose between cotton crops, like using water for cotton crops and using water for their populations. Like as we get, as, as the planet becomes hotter, you know, we become resource strapped. And at the same time, we become, our population becomes more dense. So that sustainability element is really comes down to keeping the carbon emissions that we have to as low as we possibly can, ideally, you know, and the degree of warm, the level of warming that we have below 1.5 degrees Celsius, so that it is sustainable that we can continue to farm where we currently farm, to live where we currently live, to have the water that we need, to have the food that we need, and not to suddenly have this um, fight for resources that will happen on a hotter planet. And then in addition to that, I really think about the fact that I tend to think about sustainability really in terms of um, bringing down those carbon emissions um, just because it's like a nice tangible thing. Um, but of course that can only happen if a business is, as you say, sustainable and profitable and can continue to run. And I think that the ethical side of it is um, really crucial as well, because there could be a world in which in an effort to really very suddenly drive down carbon emissions, you know, very drastic measures are taken that are unjust and unfair. And so, you know, that sustainability and ethical element, they really, they are really important. It is really important that they go hand in hand, um, that we have a just transition to a more sustainable model and not a rapid reduction that creates conditions that are really, really unfair um, for certain people and only allow other people to, you know, thrive and to profit. Um, and so it's really sort of making sure that those two things happen in tandem and one doesn't take over the other. I agree a hundred percent with Laura. I think that, um, like I always say a truly sustainable brand is ethical and a truly ethical brand is sustainable. Um, I think they definitely go hand in hand. I'm sure there's brands out there that are using sustainable textiles and sustainable practices, but maybe they might be using, um, you know, questionable labor. And I think it's really important to address both because I think ethical fashion is, it's all about the people. And I, people are so important. I mean, people are, in my opinion, they're the most important. Like we need to be humanistic because you, there could be people that come in and say, well, you know, we need to drive down carbon emissions. So um, everybody needs to like not have a child and 
everyone has to have an abortion or something or like even more drastic like we're going to starve people to death and so that's where sustainability can go really really wrong so we always need to keep that people aspect and the ethics part the ethical side of it like we need to keep people in mind because people are the most important part of sustainability in general and we need to take care of people in terms of in just in general, but also garment workers. Um, there's people making clothes and they, um, even the people that are getting paid really low wages, those people are making a living from making clothes. So we need to figure out how we can make a just transition from um, exploitation to a better better fashion world. Um, so I think just sustainability and sustainable fashion and ethical fashion, and it needs to be together. It, it shouldn't be separated. Um, also to address like there might be some ethical brands that are using ethical labor but then they're using polyutherane or they're using um, you know poly based textiles and then when someone buys that garment and then um, if it unfortunately ends up in a landfill is going to leach out a bunch of chemicals so I think if somebody's entering the slow fashion space they need to be considering both sides sustainability and also ethics Yeah, I yeah. I what I can add is basically to have a visual, it's ethical fashion, eco-friendly fashion are like part of the biggest, the bigger circle that is sustainability. That's it. I wouldn't say that every ethical fashion company is sustainable because I think that sustainability is mainly a mindset that takes time to achieve, that it's connected and interconnected with other, you know, it's not only about one thing that is happening in one place, it's whatever happened after that. So to add on all those great ideas and those great points that you just, that the, all the panelists talked about is, I would just add about like what, what happens after a, a garment is sold is also part of that whole process. It's not, you know, it's not only about producing and selling or, you know, growing, producing, selling, and just everything stops there. I think whatever happens in the long run of whatever, what, what we call recycling and upcycling is also a very, very important point in both, um, you know, in both definition. Uh, any designer should be able to today produce with either an upcycled or recycled fabric or to produce with a fabric that is uh, that will be able to disintegrate. So all the new uh, fabrics that are on the market today, like tensile or model that are made up of, of, of trees. So there is, I think it's this whole idea of looking at the industry as, you know, not only the industry, the industry, the consumer and everything else as one big, you know, one big um, family that, will work together toward what we call sustainability or sustainable fashion. It's the whole process of, of uh, you know, of looking at every step of the life cycle of uh, a piece of clothing. I actually had a question for Natalia. She was explaining like how a fabric um, causes damage as it ends up in a landfill. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on some other fabrics that people aren't really aware about on what environmental damage they exert. Oh, um, so it's like a lot of times it's unknown for us what's in the, the garments that we buy. Like, you know, so they have the tag and it says, but I would have to say the most harmful are polyester textiles because they're plastic, they're petroleum derived, and they basically will outlive all of us. Um, polyester was invented in the 70s, so we still don't know how long it's going to, how long it will exist for. Um, so definitely stay away from poly textiles. Um, and just like, it's also the dyes that are used in textiles that produce a lot of the environmental harm when they end up in a landfill um and that is the part that's unknown like you don't get in a label like this was dyed with blah 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 or 
or whatever it was. Um, there is a lot of awesome um, brands out there and manufacturers that are, are, are adopting a closed loop system for dyeing, which means that that water that they're using to dye those textiles is not going to end up in a river. But then there's the whole other side of it that it's like they're still using a chemical dye and then we're going to put it on our bodies. And a lot of our body, our skin is our biggest organ and it absorbs everything we put on it, even the dyes of the textiles we wear. Um, so, I mean, just from the top of my head, anything that's faux leather as ethical fashion, we love vegan leather, but not all vegan leather is created equal. Pina Tex is probably one of the better ones because it's made out of tex, uh, out of pineapples. And there's mushroom leather that's coming out too. There's a lot of innovations in vegan leather, but if it's polyutherane, that's plastic. It's petroleum derived. So anything that has like poly in it, stay away from it. Um, and I would just say um, buy or not not necessarily organic but natural textiles like linen cotton even though cotton is very problematic and that's like a whole other conversation because it uses a lot of water and um chemicals and the people growing it and picking it oftentimes end up dying very young so um but i guess in terms then that's like what's better cotton poly it's it's hard to to say. Um, I want I want to know if any of you other ladies have any textiles that are coming to mind that you're like bad bad bad. I'm thinking like maybe nylon could be really bad because that's another uh, petroleum derived textile. Um, but just anything that's like a petroleum derived textile, I feel like needs to be cut. Um, I have like a love hate relationship with um, recycled polyester. There's a lot of um, brands that are sustainable and ethical that are making um, making clothing and like bathing suits and usually it's active wear out of recycled polyester. I feel like it's still polyester. So I'm, even though I'm like, okay, I'm really happy you're trying to like save bottles from landfill. But um, yeah, I just, I'm like, uh, if it's poly, I don't want it. I agree. I just uh, wanted to add, and I, I apologize if you guys can hear the noise from my neighbor who's remodeling his house, but I think it's really, really complicated to figure out like what's okay and what's not. As Natalia was pointing out, it's really difficult and not everybody is like us and kind of dedicates our lives to figuring this out. The other thing is that the technology is so new on these things that we're just not there yet, right? Like there's problems with everything. I mean, there's problems with uh, bamboo textiles, which you would think like, what the heck is wrong with bamboo? But there's a whole lot of things. That's another panel again. So I would say if you are just, you know, a regular consumer and you're trying to do the right thing, but you don't have a lot of knowledge, invest in really high quality, like as high a quality as you can afford and read the label, do what it says and just take really good care of your stuff. Make sure that you're buying things that fit you perfectly so that you feel really good in them and want to wear them for a long time and just wear the crap out of them, like wear them until you can't wear them anymore. That's probably the best way right now to be the most, um, I guess, concerned consumer, since there are still so many problems with so many different types of textiles. Like, yes, anything that says poly, absolutely, I would 100% agree, try to avoid. But if you're like, well, it's cotton, but is it the good cotton, is it the bad cotton? Like, I don't know, don't worry so much about it. I would say worry about the quality and take really, really good care of your stuff and then wear them until they're rags. That's probably a more digestible way to look at it. And don't throw them in the trash, please. Especially, especially not poly. But on poly, the only thing is vintage. There's a lot of polyester in vintage because the 70s, like you said, were like the high, you know, it was poly was, poly and nylon were the stars of the 70s. But so you still find a lot of poly in vintage. Um, the only thing that I would add is please don't wash it in the washing machine, your poly. Maybe wash it by hand or in one of those, um, man, those bags, uh, microplastic. The guppy friend. The guppy friend. Yeah, the guppy friend, which I sell attribute if you need any. Uh, the guppy friend. Uh, 
and there is this magical little powder that will appear and instead of putting it in the water you're so if you love vintage and you know the thing with poly is that it's we don't know how it's gonna die and <laughs> how long it's gonna stay but it's very 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 like a, it's a textile that we that would stay with you for a long time so you know i would say if you buy vintage just be careful how you wash your clothes also Okay, we actually have a question from an audience member. So Diana Clavijo asked if you guys could give us some examples of clothing brands that are ethical and high quality. Okay, I'm going to shamelessly <laughs> plug myself in there. <laughs> um, my brand, um, my brand is Natalia J Mag. I make sustainable clothing and I make it ethically because I make it myself and it's made to order. Um, and it's also size customizable and I create one of a kind pieces. But other than my brand, some other brands that I love are Mara Hoffman. Um, she makes really gorgeous, high quality stuff. Um, also Grind and Glaze. Um, they make amazing, like comfortable clothes. And then you can also check out Idol Woman, who is um, their uh, sustainable fashion retailer. Um, yeah. I'll do the same. <laughs> So I'm not a brand, but I sell, I only work with brands that are, you know, I mean, I have a screening of like 15th question, not standardized regulation yet, but big screening. And in the US, I think the LA market is quite doing a good job. I found the, the West Coast market is doing a good job. Uh, I work with a brand called Backbeat Racks. I don't know if anyone knows that. I'm very happy with what I have. I've been I've been working with them for a year and a half now. So I use or I try I try so I consume my own product before just to make sure that I'm actually selling a good product. Um, you know, it's affordable, it's easy, they're small, so I don't have to make huge orders. It's kind of easy to work with them. And um, non-US brand, Mexican brands are doing actually a very good job with upcycled, upcycling material, with, um, you know, using only mostly a lot of linen because it's a more tropical weather, uh, small also cuts, you know, so, and the beauty is that they take back the product if I don't sell them, which closes my own loop uh, and they can recycle their own product. So, Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, <laughs> um, I would say my my one of my favorites is a New Zealand designer called Maggie Marilyn. Um, she does really great um, pieces that will really just be in your wardrobe for forever. They're really great quality. Um, I also really love. There's an Australian brand that um, I believe also sells in the U.S. at select stores called Elk E L K. And Elk also has this incredible sustainability report on their website if you just feel like being a nerd or actually if you're kind of new to sustainable fashion, I actually feel like this is a good resource to just kind of have a look at and get a sense of like what this done well looks like. Um, so Elk is a really good one. And then of course, Patagonia, they're not necessarily sustainable in the way that they make everything, but um, I really love the way that they are heavily involved in lobbying government because essentially like that is a very important piece of this puzzle that's going to move it forward and they bake that into all of their messaging in a way um, to my knowledge is very genuine and authentic and so um, I definitely love to uh, to spend some money at Patagonia if I'm if I'm on the market for something. Yeah, um, Patagonia and Stella McCartney are kind of the two big powerhouses of the movement right now. Um, I would actually like to recommend an app um, that has been very helpful for me. So there's an app called Good On You that you can use to look up some of your favorite fashion brands and see where they're at with um, 
the envi you know, environmental impact, where they're at with animal cruelty and transparency, things like that. Um, so they will actually rate different brands. So if you want to just look up Adidas or, you know, whatever, Everlane or whatever, you can see what they're doing and they put descriptions of what they have found on each um, of these brands on their app. Um, also, if you are just looking, like let's say you're looking to buy a swimsuit or something, you can type in swimsuit and it will bring up a list of brands organized according to their rating, and, um, like in sustainability and whatnot, um, so that when you're going to look for a swimsuit, you can go and start, you know, start with the brands that are more sustainably responsible. So they also have um, an option on there to like, let's say you, you know, really like a certain brand and you look them up and they totally suck, right? <laughs> like they're not doing a good job. You can, through their app, write a letter to ask them for more transparency or, you know, better ethical treatment of animals or whatever it is, stop animal testing. Um, and they have templates on there too, to make it really easy. So I would just say, I mean, there's so many out there. I mean, Amor Bear comes to mind, uh, El Rally, um, Muda, like there's there's a bunch, Kowtow, but I would take a look on that app. Um, it's a free app and just start getting to know what brands are, are more sustainable and more responsible and which aren't. And anytime you're looking to buy something, you know, check really quick on there, like, okay, I need, you know, this, whatever, what are some good brands for that? I want to add on to a point Laura made that was really great. It was regarding how Patagonia has been lobbying for some changes to and regulations on production practices. And so something I definitely want to touch on is especially countries in Europe have taken actions and pieces of legislation to make sure that brands are accountable for their actions and that there is regulation for how these practices are being handled. And so I think it'd be really great to touch on legislation, especially in the US that can be taken and what roles consumers can have in demanding the same things. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that I am qualified, nor do we have the time for me to kind of dive into sort of legislative specifics. Um, but uh, I can say with almost total certainty that there's basically no legislation currently in place in the US that would kind of support a sustainable um, fashion agenda. Um, and that's something that we really need to change. Um, so. And I think that to, you know, to circle back to what I was saying earlier in the panel is that um, consumer, uh, I, I mean, I, I hate the word consumer. It's so like people pressure, not consumer, because you're not consumers, you're citizens and people living like in this world and like you buy clothing for joy and because it makes you happy and because it makes you feel good and like not to consume, like you know, it is an expression of, of who you are. So um, people and citizens, like we can lobby government endlessly and over 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 again some more and just keep demanding, you know, a, a just transition to green energy. I think that, you know, the thing that I would love to see is that sustainable fashion like sustainable fashion and all industries, again, as I said earlier, we really have to bring down all the carbon output. So it's almost like we don't, anytime you feel yourself getting really stuck in the minutia of kind of like what is and isn't sustainability, I highly recommend that you just pull out and just say, okay, what this means is that the bigger work to be done is that we just move away from fossil fuels because that is going to make the biggest impact. And so, you know, it's kind of like if you want to continue to shop for joy, then lobby for a transition to green energy. And then you can, you know, it's like it's it's easier. It's not easier is not the, the right word, but, you know, if we change where we get our energy, a lot changes. And whilst 
the small, you know, for a long time, I felt very strongly in kind of the incremental change within the fashion system, but so much time has passed and so little change has been made and the clock is running out that we really need to start thinking bigger. So I kind of have gotten a little bit myself into the headspace of like, I want to, uh, I, I still always support brands who are as sustainable and ethical as possible because that that is who I believe in and where I want to spend my money. Um, but I kind of look, if I'm feeling very overwhelmed, I just think to myself, well, I'm going to dress fabulous and go and, you know, write a letter to my Congress person saying, I want a green new deal or, you know, whatever the demand may be. And, um, you know, and kind of finding a way to make sure that, the passion that I have for sustainability within fashion grows beyond just that space and really just helps to kind of move the overall tide to a place where we, we are just doing the thing that we ought to be doing that we've, that we've known that we should be doing for a really long time, which is bringing down all our carbon and um, totally rethinking the way that we get energy and the way that we use up Earth's resources. All I really have to say to this is just amen. Like, I really think that was nail on the head, amen. Um, I think that we can definitely end this panel on a positive note. And so I'd like to give our panelists some time to kind of just share some words of wisdom as our viewers kind of venture into this world of fashion if they choose to and so yeah okay I can go first <laughs> um so I mean I think it's really important to take stock of what you already own like the most sustainable garment you can ever get is the one you already have the one that's already in your closet, in your possession. So um, just taking stock of what you own, seeing if there's things that you can upcycle. Upcycling is actually really easy. All you, all you really need is a seam ripper and a pair of scissors. And you can turn a pair of jeans into shorts. You can turn a dress into a top. You can turn a, a long sleeve shirt into a, like a, a short sleeve shirt. So um, just seeing what you can do with what you already own. And then like trying to figure out different ways to style what you already own. Another way that you can start to be more sustainable is by swapping clothes. You can swap with your friends, with your with your mom, if you guys are a similar size or like your cousins, your family, you can have like a post, like a clothing swap party. Um, even though it's like with COVID, mm, I don't know, maybe just do it with your family or your roommates for now. Um, but clothing swapping, it's a great way to get started. Another great way to be like introduced into sustainable fashion is buying secondhand clothing, buying vintage clothing, shopping from like Poshmark or, or the real real. Um, so just getting into secondhand um, and just like taking it easy and like realize that like it's a journey. It's not like a destination. Like you just got to go with the flow and try to learn as much as you can. And like, just know that like, as long as you're realizing that there's, that you have power with your buy, with your dollar and realizing that like, you can make a difference with the, the brands that you give your money to. It's the first, most important first step. And um, yeah, just, you know, um, wearing what you already have. That's also really important. Wear what you already have. I agree. Um, I, adding on to what Natalia said, I would say within that also learn about yourself and your personal style. Um, because that will help you utilize the garments that you already own. Um, and it will help you be a better shopper too. So uh, one of the things in my business, we have like this little line we say that are like trends are so last season. Um, and what we mean by that is that, you know, trends are essentially people telling us you need to wear this. And I think 
that's so passe, right? It's time to move beyond trends. So I hope for the fashion industry and for um, people, definitely, I like the point of people, not consumers, right? Um, that we as people, as individuals, learn about ourselves and what we like to see on our bodies, like what silhouettes we like, what fabrics we like on our bodies, you know, what feels good, what doesn't feel good, what is right for our daily lives. You know, this is something that has really kind of helped, like that COVID has actually kind of helped us in, right? Is trends, like who cares about trends when you're working from home and the only people that you see are the ones that you're living at home with? You know, like my dog doesn't care what I wear, <laughs> you know? So curate your own personal style be a participant in your own personal style. Don't let, you know, the Kardashians tell you what to wear. Don't let clothing brands tell you what to wear or what you're supposed to wear. You figure that out and you, you know, create your own style that you're proud of. And in doing that, you're going to want to continue to wear your garments. So, you know, for, for longer, which will help, you know, create a more sustainable world. So, and I guess hand in hand with that too, is to know your brands and know your measurements. Because if you get to know your brands, you'll know what like a size eight is. And if you are a size eight, you'll know that that size eight will likely fit you. Because a size eight in one store, you know, at, I don't know, Nordstrom, whatever is different from a size eight at Forever 21, you know? So get to know your brands, get to know your measurements and get to know yourself and your personal style. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. I uh, unfortunately spent a decade being that person telling you what to wear, uh, working uh, in fashion magazines, and um, and you know, to to my point earlier, I mean, I, I can tell you that the same people who are kind of disseminating trends are also like slightly miserable being held to them. Um, And this point of like joy and joy and celebration around dressing is really exactly the point that you all are making, which is like establishing and finding your own personal unique style is like uplifting for the soul as well as for the planet and um, abandoning ideas around what you should and shouldn't wear is um such a healthy uh transition to make um you know i myself like definitely had to unlearn a lot of ideas around having the newest and the latest and you know like just a lot of outdated really silly ideas around what um a good and fun and nourishing relationship is with clothing and fashion and having moved away from that um you know it helps me to save money it frees up my space to concentrate on other things like saving the planet um and it's just generally has been um a very freeing liberating experience and uh i think that um, anyone who I know who has kind of done the same thing has said the same thing. I've never met anyone who's kind of been like, you know what? I really loved it when I was like switching trends every two weeks and just buying a bunch of junk. Like, I don't know anyone who feels that way. And so, um, I do think that really, I mean, COVID is kind of the best time for this, right? Is to, to your point, go in your closet, play around with an outfit, wear it in your house for a day, see how it makes you feel like see the difference, try something you haven't tried. Like, you know, there is an opportunity now to kind of, to kind of do that and, and, you know, and to do it without the pressure of um, having, you know, if you've like never upcycled before without, without having to go out and feel strange or anything, you can really just like have a lot of fun in your home and, you know, do it like that. So I don't know, it can be a COVID, uh, a COVID mission to kind of like go in and play around with your wardrobe and your look and see how it goes for you. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, it's important to understand that historically fashion was never made to be so fast. Fashion was always slow. It was made for dormant. People in the court were used to walk, showing off and the latest 
you know, a, a piece of a textile from, I don't know, East, uh, from East Asia. Or, so it was never made to be an industry that was so fast. It was a very slow industry. It was well, mostly made in-house, uh, you know, recycling was very common back in the time. So I think that in my case, I think for me, it's the question of, uh, realizing that fashion matters, that no, it's not a superficial industry. It's not only about the red carpet. It's much more than that. It matters because it's because of its history, because it's also a portrait of, it depicts, it's, we can understand humans and societies by looking at fashion and think about art history. So I think we need to go beyond that idea that a piece of clothing is just a piece of clothing. It's much more, it's just like a piece of textile. It's much more than that. So that's one thing. And by doing that, you start caring. By caring and, and you associate care with happiness, obviously, oh my God, this is a dress that I wore at my first date with my husband. I will always remember that dress and I will always take care of that dress and be happy wearing that dress. So I think it's a lot of association that unfortunately fast fashion and consumerism kind of um, you know broke uh, or created a system where the more i buy the richer i will feel and it's not true so it's going out of that mentality and going into the mentality of you know i care for the clothes that i wear i you know i'm not only buying trends i don't i think we're living anyway the I think the fashion um, cycle is going back to two seasons. Um, you know, Gucci already took took out the word trends and even the fashion show from their uh, vocabulary. So there is a lot of change, and it's a question of you know love your love your clothes, respect your clothes, respect the people who made your clothes, take care of them, and believe me, they will probably give you much more than you know. But they're, I mean, hopefully they're already giving you a lot. So. I want to thank all the panelists for joining us today in this discussion. It has been a huge honor to be with you all discussing this topic. And of course, I want to thank our audience members for watching and of course, Ernest for helping set this up. I hope you all have a lovely rest of the day and I look forward to our next panel. Bye.